Even though the Knoxville campaign in the autumn of 1863 was largely successful for the Union forces, they did incur some losses along the way. The main leaders of the battles were Major General Ambrose Burnside and Lieutenant General James Longstreet. The Battle of Philadelphia would be one such loss that occurred on October 20, 1863. The main commanders for the Battle of Philadelphia would be Major General William T. Martin and Confederate Brigadier General Frank Crawford Armstrong against Union Colonel Frank Wolford. The Union would come back to claim Philadelphia, Tennessee once more the next day, but they would abandon the town soon after. Come along with us as we walk through one of the losses that would happen for the Union side of the Civil War during the Knoxville Campaign. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine. Please fasten your seatbelts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up that time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces the YouTube algorithm that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. The Confederate Forces Strength The Confederate Forces battle units were divided into two major divisions. One belonged to General William T. Martin, and the other belonged to Brigadier General Frank Crawford Armstrong. This meant that the Confederate forces had two cavalry brigades and an attached artillery. Martin's division included the 1st Brigade, which is also called the Detachment, which was also attached to Debril's Brigade. Brigadier General John Tyler Morgan was in charge. Martin also commanded the forces of the 2nd Brigade. Colonel J.J. Morrison was in charge. Morrison commanded the 1st Georgia Cavalry Regiment, 2nd Georgia Cavalry Regiment, 3rd Georgia Cavalry Regiment, 4th Georgia Cavalry Regiment, and 6th Georgia Cavalry Regiment. Armstrong's division included the 1st Brigade commanded by Colonel George Gibbs DeBrill and the 2nd Brigade commanded by Colonel C.H. Tyler. Colonel George Gibbs DeBrill commanded the 4th Tennessee Cavalry Regiment Braxter Smith's 5th Tennessee Cavalry Regiment McKenzie's, which was also attached to Morrison's Brigade, 8th Tennessee Cavalry Regiment, which was DeBrill's, 9th Tennessee Cavalry Regiment, and the 10th Tennessee Cavalry Regiment. Colonel C.H. Tyler commanded the Jesse's Kentucky Cavalry Battalion, which was also attached to the Morrison's Brigade. The Federal Forces Strength we could not find who was in command of each of these divisions, only that Union Colonel Frank Wolford was in command of the Union Cavalry Brigade during the time of the attack. The Union forces held the 1st Kentucky Cavalry Regiment, 11th Kentucky Cavalry Regiment, 12th Kentucky Cavalry Regiment, and the 45th Ohio Mountain Infantry Regiment. This meant that the Union forces held one cavalry brigade and six artillery guns in this fight. Background Before the fight for Philadelphia, Tennessee was to begin, we have already discussed the battles for Blue Springs and the Cumberland Gap. Both of these losses caused Major General Samuel Jones to call on the Confederate government to send help through Confederate Commander Braxton Bragg, who was still in Chattanooga. Bragg sent an infantry division led by Major General Carter L. Stevenson along with two cavalry brigades commanded by Colonel George Gibbs DeBrill and Colonel J.J. Morrison. The troops were sent to cause trouble for the Union forces in the area. Because of the shortages of equipment on the East Tennessee and Georgia Railroad, Stevenson's infantry was only able to reach as far as Charleston on October the 19th. So Stevenson sent DeBrill and Morrison ahead to attack Philadelphia. There was a brigade under the command of Brigadier General John C. Vaughn at Sweetwater, which was located just six miles south of Philadelphia. However, this brigade had been captured at the Battle of Vicksburg and had been paroled and exchanged recently, so it was not ready to take the field of battle once again. However, Vaughn did take an active role in planning and organizing the attack. The day before the attack. 
on October 19th, about 10 o'clock a.m., Morrison's 1,800 cavalry men had crossed the Hiawassee River west of Charleston at King's Cannon Ferry. While passing west of Philadelphia to get behind Wolford's men, the brigade was able to capture wagons and 40 Union soldiers. The plan was for the next morning, October 20th, 1863, that DeBrill's brigade, under the orders of Stevenson, would advance and attack the Federal forces at Philadelphia. Morrison was directed to get behind the Federal forces and cooperate with DeBrill. DeBrill and Morrison discussed the plan of action and decided the attack would start at noon instead of dawn. Morrison would later send a message to DeBrill stating that his men would not be in position until after 2 o'clock p.m. The Attack Already in position, DeBrill split his forces into two divisions. One skirmished with the Union Army, while the other division remained hidden. Artillery fire was exchanged between the two sides, and the duel lasted for about an hour. Morrison had the telegraph lines cut so that messages could not be sent to Brigadier General Julius White, Infantry Division, that was in Loudoun, just six miles away from Philadelphia. Morrison then sent one of his regiments against White to keep them busy and away from the battle at Philadelphia. The Defeat Morrison attacked Wolford's men twice, but were driven back both times. Realizing that Morrison was on his rear flanks, Wolford ordered Colonel Silas Adams with the 1st Kentucky and the 11th Kentucky Cavalry Regiments to engage Morrison, but this was unsuccessful. Adams had managed to capture 50 prisoners and return them to Loudoun. Wolford took his remaining 700 cavalry troops and faced Debril, who was coming from the south in battle. Morrison then ordered the cannons to fire at the Union rear. Debril immediately launched his attack, and the Union forces fell into a rout. In the aftermath, six mountain howitzers were left behind in the confusion. The Confederates managed to capture 50 wagons that were loaded with supplies, 10 ambulances, 75 head of cattle, and a number of horses and mules. The total losses were for the Union 7 men killed, 25 men wounded, and 447 men captured, leaving a total of casualties to 479. The Confederate losses included 15 men killed, 82 men wounded, and 70 men captured, with a total of 167 casualties. Loudoun County in the Future Battles the next day on October 20th, White's infantry rallied the remains of Wolford's brigade and recaptured Philadelphia. Morrison and DeBrill retreated two and a half miles northeast of Sweetwater, Tennessee. White abandoned Philadelphia by nightfall and the Confederates came back to occupy the area once again. Stevenson's infantry arrived in town on October 23rd. The Union soldiers abandoned and evacuated Loudoun on October 28th. They would fall back to help Burnside hold the line from Kingston through the line of Little Tennessee River to help to keep from any further attacks from the south. Loudoun County, Tennessee would once again see battles in the Civil War in November and December of 1863. The last activity in the area would be a raid conducted by Confederate General Joseph Wheeler in the summer of 1864. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Civil War Battles. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notification button. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries in Appalachian history.